I'm Alfin Bow, and welcome to January Jackanory. Make yourself cosy and comfortable and listen to the tale of the singing, soaring lark. There was once upon a time a man who was about to set out on a long journey and on parting he asked his three daughters what he should bring back with him for them. Whereupon the eldest wished for pearls, the second wished for diamonds, and the third said, Dear father, I should like a singing, soaring lark. Now, when the time had come for him to be on his way home again, he had brought pearls and diamonds for the two eldest, but he had sought everywhere in vain for a singing, soaring lark for the youngest, and he was very unhappy about it, for she was his favourite child. Then his road lay through a forest, and in the midst of it was a splendid castle, and near the castle stood a tree, but quite on top of the tree he saw a singing, soaring lark. Aha! you come just at the right moment, he said, and called to his servant to climb up and catch the little creature. But as he approached the tree, a lion leapt from beneath it, shook himself and roared till the leaves on the trees trembled. He who tries to steal my singing, soaring lark, he cried, will I devour. Then the man said, I did not know the bird belonged to you. I will make amends for the wrong I have done and ransom myself with a large sum of money, if only you can spare my life. Then the lion said, nothing can save you unless you will promise to give me for my own what first meets you on your return home. And if you will do that, I will grant you your life and you shall have the bird for your daughter into the bargain. The servant, however, was terrified and said, why should your daughter be the one to meet you? It might easily be a cat or a dog. Then the man allowed himself to be persuaded, took the singing, soaring lark and promised to give the lion whatsoever should first meet him on his return home. When he reached home and entered his house, the first who met him was no other than his youngest and dearest daughter, who came running up, kissed and embraced him. And when she saw that he had brought with him a singing, soaring lark, she was beside herself with joy. The father, however, could not rejoice, but began to weep and said, my dearest child, I have bought a little bird, dear. In return for it, I have been obliged to promise you to a savage lion, and when he has you, he will tear you into pieces and devour you. And he told her all, just as it had happened, and begged her not to go there. But she consoled him and said, Dearest father, indeed your promise must be fulfilled. I will go and soften the lion so that I may return to you safely. Next morning, she had the road pointed out to her, took leave, and went fearlessly out into the forest. The lion, however, was an enchanted prince and was by day a lion, and all his people were lions with him, but in the night they resumed their natural human shapes. On her arrival, she was kindly received and led into the castle. When night came, the lion turned into a handsome man and their wedding was celebrated with great magnificence. They lived happily together, remained awake at night and slept in the daytime. One day he came and said, Tomorrow there is a feast in your father's house because your eldest sister is to be married. And if you are inclined to go there, my lions shall conduct you. She said, Yes, I should very much like to see my father again and went there accompanied by the lions. There was great joy when she arrived for they had all believed she'd been torn to pieces by the lion and had long ceased to live. But then she told them what a handsome husband she had and how well off she was and remained with them while the wedding feast lasted and then went back again into the forest. When the second daughter was about to be married and she was again invited to the wedding, she said to the lion, this time I will not be alone, you must come with me. The lion, however, said that it was too dangerous for him, for if when there a ray from a burning candle fell on him, he would be changed into a dove and for seven years long would have to fly about with the doves. She said, oh, but do come with me. I will take great care of you and guard you from all light. So they went away together and took with them their little child as well. She had a room built there so strong and thick that no ray could pierce through it. In this, he was to shut himself up when the candles were lit for the wedding feast. But the door was made of green wood, which warped and left a little crack when no one noticed. The wedding was celebrated with magnificence. But when the procession with all its candles and torches came back from church and passed by this apartment, a ray about the breadth of a hair fell on the king's son. And when this ray touched him, 
he was transformed in an instant. And when she came in and looked for him, she didn't see him, but a white dove was sitting there. The dove said to her, For seven years must I fly about the world, but at every seventh step that you take, I will let fall a drop of red blood and a white feather, and these will show you the way. And if you follow the trace, you can release me. Thereupon the dove flew out at the door, and she followed him, and at every seventh step a red drop of blood and a little white feather fell down and showed her the way. So she went continually further and further into the wide world, never looking about her or resting, and the seven years were almost past. Then she rejoiced and thought they would soon be saved, and yet they were so far from it. Once when they were thus moving onwards, no little feather and no drop of red blood fell, and when she raised her eyes, the dove had disappeared, and she thought to herself, in this no man can help you. She climbed up to the sun and said to him, you shine into every crevice and over every peak. Have you not seen a white dove flying? No, said the sun. I have seen none, but I present you with a casket. Open it when you are in sorest need. Then she thanked the sun and went on until evening came and moon appeared. And then she asked her, you shine the whole night through and on every field and forest. Have you not seen a white dove flying? No, said the moon, I have seen no dove, but here, I give you an egg. Break it when you are in great need. She thanked the moon and went on until the night wind came up and blew on her. And then she said to it, You blow over every tree and every leaf. Have you not seen a white dove flying? No, said the night wind. I have seen none, but I will ask the other three winds. Perhaps they have seen it. The east wind and the west wind came and had seen nothing. But the south wind said, I have seen the white dove. It has flown to the Red Sea, where it has become a lion again. For the seven years are over, and the lion is there fighting with a dragon. The dragon, however, is an enchanted princess. The night wind then said to her, I will advise you, go to the Red Sea. On the right bank there are some tall reeds. Count them, break off the eleventh, and strike the dragon with it. Then the lion will be able to subdue it, and both then will regain their human form. After that, Look round and you will see the griffin which is by the Red Sea. Swing yourself with your beloved onto his back and the bird will carry you over the sea to your own home. Here is a nut for you. When you are above the centre of the sea, drop the nut and it will immediately shoot up and a tall nut tree will grow out of the water on which the griffin may rest. For if he cannot rest, he will not be strong enough to carry you across. And if you forget to throw down the nut, he will let you fall into the sea. Then she went and found everything as the night wind had said. She counted the reeds by the sea, cut off the eleventh, struck the dragon therewith, whereupon the lion conquered it, and immediately both of them regained their human shapes. But when the princess, who had been the dragon, was released from enchantment, she took the youth by the arm, seated herself on the griffin, and carried him off with her. There stood the poor maiden who had wandered so far, and was again forsaken. She sat down and cried, but at last she took courage and said, Still I will go as far as the wind blows and as long as the cock crows until I find him. And she went forth by long, long roads until at last she came to the castle where both of them were living together. There she heard that soon a feast was to be held in which they would celebrate their wedding. But she said, God still helps me, and opened the casket that the sun had given her. A dress lay therein, as brilliant as the sun itself. So she took it out and put it on, and went up to the castle, and everyone, even the bride herself, looked at her with astonishment. The dress pleased the bride so well that she thought it might do for her wedding dress, and asked if it was for sale. Not for money or land, said she, but for flesh and blood. The bride asked her what she meant by that, so she said, Let me sleep a night in the chamber where the bridegroom sleeps. The bride would not, yet very much wanted to have the dress, so at last she consented, but the page was to give the prince a sleeping draught. When it was night, therefore, and the youth was already asleep, she was led into the chamber. She seated herself on the bed and said, I have followed you for seven years. I have been to the sun and the moon and the four winds, and have inquired for you and have helped you against the dragon. Will you then quite forget me? But the prince slept so soundly that it only seemed to him as if the wind were whistling outside in the fir trees. When the day broke, she was led out again and had to give up the golden dress. And as that even had been of no avail, she was sad, went out into the meadow, sat down there and wept. 
While she was sitting there, she thought of the egg which the moon had given her. She opened it, and there came out a clucking hen with twelve chickens, all of gold. And they ran about chirping and crept again under the old hen's wings. Nothing more beautiful was ever seen in the world. Then she arose and drove them through the meadow before her until the bride looked out of the window. The little chickens pleased her so much that she immediately came down and asked if they were for sale, not for money or land, but for flesh and blood. Let me sleep another night in the chamber where the bridegroom sleeps. The bride said yes, intending to cheat her, as on the former evening. But when the prince went to bed, he asked the page what all the murmuring and rustling in the night had been. On this the page told all, that he had been forced to give him a sleeping draught, because a poor girl had slept secretly in the chamber, and that he was to give him another one that night. The prince said, pour out the draught by the bedside. At night she was again led in, and when she began to relate how ill all had fared with her, he immediately recognised his beloved wife by her voice, sprang up and cried, Now I really am released. I have been, as it were, in a dream, for the strange princess has bewitched me so that I have been compelled to forget you. But God has delivered me from this spell at the right time. Then they both left the castle secretly in the night, for they feared the father of the princess, who was a sorcerer, and they seated themselves on the griffin, which bore them across the Red Sea. And when they were in the midst of it, she let fall the nut. Immediately a tall nut tree grew up, whereupon the bird rested, and then carried them home, where they found their child, who had grown tall and beautiful, and they lived thenceforth happily until their death. The end. And if you have enjoyed this story, please like and comment and share and subscribe to my YouTube channel so you don't miss any of the other January Jack and Ori tales. Thank you for joining me. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.